from right here and ev everywhere you can see is where Franklin grew up and sp spent his youth hunting and roaming these mountains. That, 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 that little top knob right there, that's, that's a, uh, the top of, uh, of uh, Pinnacle Mountain. Yeah, and Pinnacle Mountain, they say Sassafras Mountain is the highest mountain in South Carolina. And it, it is the highest point, but half of it's in North Carolina. Pinnacle Mountain is the highest mountain that's totally in South Carolina, okay? And if you was to move over here to your left, you'd see a big rock, it's called Ball Knob. And so when you're, whenever you're going down Highway 11, you'll see that big rock. You'll know that's Pinnacle Mountain, that's Ball Knob there. That's the, that should be, that should be the part of the draw bar cliffs, those rocks there. That long ridge through there, that whole ridge is called Horse Mountain. And that's Horse Gap, that little dip in there. There's a road that goes right through that little dip, that little saddle. And that little knob to the far left, that's called Naked Knob. That's just an extension of Horse Mountain. And you can't tell it now because the trees have grown back up. But as you go down and it starts to level off a little bit, we busted a marijuana field in there that was about the size of a football field. Had 11 Mexicans working it. And they were armed with AR-15 assault rifles. What year was that? That was year 2005. Yeah. There was somebody local, and that was one thing Franklin was passionate about that he passed on to me. Franklin had a saying, I'd, I'd rather catch a man growing marijuana any day than fishing without a license. It's easy to write a fishing ticket without a license. That's easy to do. It's not so easy to find somebody growing marijuana up in here. But um, if, you come, if you come down from Pinnacle, just to the left of Pinnacle, there's a, little, there's a creek, and it's called Pinnacle Creek. There's a cave up there. It's actually just a big rock outcropping, and they stacked up rocks and made a cave. Had a fireplace in it with a chimney, a little cot, and they were living in that cave where I found that 22 pistol, I mean that BB pistol, it looked like a 45 in there that time, remember? That's right, Ben, Ben was the first one, he said, I, he, Ben was the first one to go up there with me to look at it again. Uh, who's that other fellow that was a friend of yours that died? Robert. Robert, Chapman. Robert Chapman. Ben, ben, ben Underwood and Robert Chapman went with me. And it was, uh, when you entered the entrance of that cave, there was a little tree, and on the other side of that tree was a little, uh, was a, I don't know what you'd call it, but it, it would hold a 12-gauge shotgun shell. And it had a trip line, a monofilament trip line. If you hit that trip line, that shotgun shell would go off. But anyway, we got a pretty good bag of marijuana out of it, but the two suspects were long gone because it took us three days to locate it. But it didn't take us three days to locate that one up there. That's the biggest field we ever hit. Normally, if you get a marijuana field, you know, about the size of your living room, you think you've done something. And uh, so this is the first one we ever had. There was one in Greenville County the year before, over in the watershed in Greenville County. And they procrastinated on it, waited about a week before they were going to go hit it, and they were gone. Yeah. But anyway, this is where Franklin grew up, and in fact, you can, and you can't see Sassafras Mountain from here. Sassafras Mountain, you go from Pinnacle Mountain, and in behind there is Emory Gap, and you'd follow the hiking trail all the way to 
on the other side of Horse Mountain, you, it'd be Sassafras Mountain. And in fact, uh, Franklin's daddy, old Charlie Gravely, uh, was the county ranger here in Pickens County for years. And there, back then, not everybody had a telephone, okay? So Franklin was one of the very, very few people because his dad was the county ranger that had a telephone. And there's an old telephone line that ran all the way from uh, Sassafras Mountain down to Franklin and Charlie Gravely's house right down here on 178. Because he, he, he was in charge of, there was, a, there was a tower, or used to be a tower up there on Sassafras Mountain. Yeah, one of the fire lookout towers. Yes. And so uh, I think, I think, Mike, you actually had to help your daddy cut that uh, line a couple times, clear it out. And uh, so uh, that's a long ways to go with one telephone line for one house. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But uh, this is basically where Franklin grew up. This is the church that he went to. Franklin was a dedicated family man. He was very religious. He, Franklin was one of the very few people that I have ever worked with that I never, ever heard him say a cuss word. And I worked with him for just a little over three years. I've, no, he's, he's telling the truth. <laughs> I've, I've heard him say a little something. But Franklin never said a cuss word, okay? Only, only, the worst thing I'd, I'd hear Franklin say is, you know, that, that, that makes me mad. That's the worst thing he'd say. But uh, Franklin was a big man, and uh, he's very, very very extremely athletic without even, you know, this was before, long before uh, shows about staying in shape. I mean, that was just his way of life. He played softball, you know, he could run, he could, he could outrun almost any other game warden. And he prided himself on being able to catch somebody, okay? He tried to teach me how to track He'd go through the woods, he, we, or we'd start off where we thought somebody started off and he'd be going down through the woods and he'd look, and Mike, you correct me if I'm wrong, but he'd look here and he'd look there and he said, there he goes, there he goes. I told my granddaddy about that. My granddaddy got, was a Lutheran preacher. He got a big kick about going down there, not seeing nobody, but just seeing the tracks and saying, there he goes, there he goes. But anyway, I just wanted to come up here, honor the man, visit his grave. And if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask. But we have a young man here that was one of Franklin's best friends. His name is Yancey Anders. Uh, I sold his younger brother a blue tick hound that he says was no good, but, <laughs> but um, so I don't know what he thinks of me. But uh, but anyway, we, I've hunted with Yancey. Yancey, Yancey was a, has always been a dedicated outdoorsman, dedicated hunter, and was a, a very good friend of Franklin's. And he's got a busted up arm, shoulder. And uh, anyway, he does, he, he can't be riding in that rough road. So I want to give Yancey an opportunity to talk and say something about Franklin right now. All right, uh, how y'all doing? Uh, like I said, my name is Yancey Anders and I grew up just several hundred feet right down the road here on 288. And uh, all my life, I uh, grew up around Franklin Gravely and his daddy Charlie and Lom his mom and daddy were Charlie and Lomi Gravely and uh, 
we go went to church in the old church. There was another church here when I was growing up, and uh, I'm 54, so I give you an idea. But got to know in Franklin, and you know, as you grow up, and uh, my sister Diane, I was the same age, so I was around this family all my life. So Franklin Gravely was well respected. Franklin Gravely was a big man, bigger than anybody here that's here today. He's tall, broad shoulders, big man. When I got to growing up, and my uncle, this is all family right in here, everybody's family up in here. My uncle, Donnie Chastain, my daddy was a truck driver, so he worked hard shifts. So he didn't have no children, so he took me and my brothers, he took turns taking us hunting. But what I can remember, um, well, let me start off playing softball first. We played softball, and I, when I was big enough to play, Mike uh, uh, was my group best friend. I got real close to Mike Gravely, and we were best friends, and uh, his wife's local too, and both of them are my best friends. We're playing softball. Franklin always pitched. When I got up older where I could play with the adults sometimes when they didn't have enough, I thought that was something else. That was a big honor to be on the same team as Franklin and Mike Gravely. Well, Franklin, you know, he had a knuckleball that uh, Eddie and Randy Davis both uh, know well because they played on we played on the same team and that thing would not move. It's dead still, and you have a little bit of wind, it do it move on you a little bit. But Franklin was already up in age. He was my age then, still playing, and he was 60, still playing. I said, "Mike, is, is your daddy all right? Don't worry about my daddy. He'll be all right." I said, "Okay, because you're a pitcher, you have." And Mr. McJunkin knows. I know Mr. McJunkin played with him a long time ago. But I remember Franklin getting hit in the shin, hit in the leg, hit in the stomach, hit toward the face, and he'd catch it, hat go off, and his glasses. And I look over at Mike. Mike, just, he'll be all right. Don't worry about Daddy. He'll be all right. <laughs> and sure enough, the man was tough. He took shots after shot. But finally, I think he he gave it up. But my, he was a very a uh, great athlete. I could tell years ago, he, I know he was something else. But playing soccer, and Mike said, just play ball, he'll be fine. Well, going back to my uncle hunting, when I got up grazing, going hunting, everybody hunted, everybody knew everybody and where everybody hunted. Well, always on my mind when I'd go hunting, would when we go in the woods, would he be shh, quiet. Pick up your feet. Pick up your feet. I said, gee, this hunting deal ain't going to be too fun. <laughs> Long story short, I said, why, when we get home back over down here, and I said, well, why? Why do I have to be so quiet? Why do I have to pick up my feet? Well, we don't want Frank and Gravely knowing when we at. <laughs> I said, why is that? I said, he, he said, oh, yeah, Frank and Gravely. And, and all them times he kept taking me in Camp Adger. I swore my uncle and Bobby Joe, Franklin's brother, and uh, some of the Chastines would all hunt in there. Well, he picked, just pick up your feet. Well, what Hound Dog talked about is my uncle finally showed me when I got a little older and I knew what I was doing, and I could remember. He said, you see these leaves right here? He said, I said, yeah, so? He said, Franklin can track you. I said, yeah, right. Well, he said, walk up there and come back. He'd show me the leaves turn a certain way, this way when you're going up, and they turn a different way when you're coming down. He said, Franklin will track you step by step. And the noise, he said, Franklin would come to the gate, and he'd just listen. He ain't trying to go after you, but Franklin done his job. So all hunters back in those days had in the back of their mind, is it really worth it breaking the rule? Is it really worth it? Because you never know where Franklin Gravely is at. My uncle said he'd lay down on a log. This is before major uh, real tree and mossy oak and all that stuff. And game wardens just had green on them like this young man over here. He'd cover himself up in leaves all up. And he'd be laying there because he done patterns you. He knew where you was hunting. He'd come up on you and he'd be... You never heard him. You never seen him. Hey. 
turn around, that's where I can grab it. He said, let me see your license. Make sure you got your license. Had your license, you're doing fine, he'd leave you alone. But the man knew how to track. The man was a major, major outdoorsman. And you always had in the back of your mind, is Frank and Grabbin watching me? Is Frank and Grabbin? Where is Frank and Grabbin? On July, January the 1st, back in those days, January 1st was the big football. Nah, Frank and love football, but it, I knew my uncle would say, listen, that's Frank and Grabbin. I said, you're crazy. Come out of the gate, his truck be sitting there. He didn't sit there all, he didn't watch that ball game. He'd come in and do his job. Even though he'd rather be watching that big uh, Orange Bowl or Rose Bowl and all them big games, but Franklin Grab had done his job, and you never know where he was at. He was so feared by hunters. Very seldom back in those days they would take that chance because Franklin Gravely would hear a shot at his house. He'd take off. They got to come out, make sure they're legal, make sure they done this, if was it those day, was it this, this, and this, because the man worked very hard to preserve all you see and all up to Table Rock and back. The man wanted to have wildlife. He brought wildlife in here and he preserved it and he done it in a way to it flourished, but he didn't want the bad apples ruin it for everybody. He wanted it to be fair, but the man could track. The man, he, he was so I mean, they were so feared of him. My uncle, if it was raining, they'd park at the gate as far as you could go because you couldn't, well, back in them days, they wasn't four-wheelers and hey, maybe some motorcycles, but he would say, be still. And he, man, my uncle would walk backwards out around to the truck and get me, and he'd sit me down because I was too big to carry, and he'd carry his gun. And he said, do what I tell you. And I said, okay. Walk backwards with me. I said, do what? <laughs> Why? He said, because you never know. Franklin park his truck down here a mile. He'd walk a mile up to the gate and be sitting there in the woods listening to you. All your conversations. So you never knew where Franklin's at. He didn't have to be at his truck. He wouldn't park his truck where sometimes Franklin be parked his truck a mile down the road, but he'd be sitting at the gate just seeing how you do, watching how you load your gun. Did you load your gun right there? You know, it was rules. Well, um, you walk backwards. And I said, do what? He said, Frank and Grab, we ain't leaving our tracks for Frank and Grab and see where we went in at. No, you walk backwards. <laughs> Many a times, turn around, walk back, get out of the mud, walk in the grass, walk in the rocks. Because he didn't want Frank and Grab to track him. Frank and Gravely was a very expert tracker and he talked about um a marijuana bus he came to the, the east toy river my uncle and him had cabins i don't know if they tipped frank and off or not but they probably did but that was some massive terrain in that area and you had to know what you're doing there was not no little rookies as hound dog said it's pretty big field pretty big operation going on major and franklin always done his homework he'd been watching them he was going in and out. He was wore out. But this is, and I didn't find, you didn't find this out to after the fact. This is when we found this out. He didn't get, <coughs> Franklin didn't tell you nothing going on while it was going on. But after the fact, he, he said they was trip lines where you could, if you hit it, you didn't know why you, if I went through there, I'd have them bales and trip lines trip. They'd be all over. But he said they was trip lines. And he said he had this young rookie that, he took in with him the game warden from Clemson. That's when we first knew about this hound dog. And uh, he was some more big, fresh, young man and was a semi-boxer and all this stuff. So he said, yeah, I took him in there with me. And I said, for what? He said, in case they got out of hand, I had a little backup young boy that I could put on him. But he tracked him with that trip line. And all the game wardens, if I ain't right, y'all was behind him, let Franklin well, leave. There was just three of us. It was me and Franklin and Gerald Hawkins. So the man knew what he was doing. And these woods, you was in his ball game. You was in his backyard, and you was at his profession, and he was an expert in these woods. Long story short, he went and caught every one of them. They got every one of them. They, some of them was in sleeping bags, and they had lookouts to look for, for uh 
the wildlife. A deputy didn't go in there. Franklin Gravely went in there. So they was, it was serious business, but Franklin called every one of them without incident. He said, now don't make me have to turn this young man on you. And he, he's a boxer now. <laughs> so they all, one man kind of in his sleeping bag started pulling his hand and Franklin told him, if you don't get your hand out, I'm gonna draw my gun. But they got them all out safely. Well, in those days, I had already learned respect for Franklin Gravely as a young age and teenager. He was respected and he was well known and they feared him. Hunters feared him, they really did. They, they knew that he would be around. Well, when I got up about 17, 18, I said, you know, I'm gonna go, Mike, I want you to go hunting with me. So I went coon hunting with him. And uh, cause I played ball and he was my coach and all that. So we went coon hunting and Franklin would go. He just was at the age of retiring. He done retired, I believe, but he said, my daddy's going too, this be us three. And I said, all right. Well, we'd go hunting. Like I say, I hadn't been on every single step of these woods, but I've hunted all, most of these mountains with Mike and Franklin and my uncle. Well, we started out Frank, you know, me and Mike had these little wheat lights. Franklin just had a flashlight. Started out, we was all together. Then all of a sudden, you didn't, Franklin wasn't around. I said, Mike, you wait on your daddy? He said, oh, stay with me. So I stayed with him. You know, he's my coach. I wanted to be, stay with Mike. I was going to get it up. And he said, if you want to be a good athlete, you want to be in shape, you don't need that gym. You need these mountains. He said, I'll get you in shape. So I wanted to stay with Mike. I said, Mike, your daddy." Let's wait on your daddy. He said, don't worry about my daddy. So we kept going, and next thing I know, there was no light back there. I said, my, he said, listen, don't worry about my daddy. You stay up with me. Well, his light got to fading, so I had a choice to make. <laughs> I couldn't find Franklin because I didn't see no light, but I could see Mike, and I was lagging way behind, and I would had no idea where I was at in them woods at night. So I tried to stay up with mine, but all of a sudden, about 9, 10 o'clock, Franklin you'd see his light coming. Because I kept looking back. I don't care what Mike said. I was worried about it. Here he come. Here he come closer. Here he come closer. Well, about halfway through the trip, he caught up with us. And Mike was sitting there. He was panting. And I was about to die. The man carried a uh, backpack. He had sardines and orange. He'd eat that sardine, can of sardines, and he'd eat that orange because he had diabetes. By the time we was getting toward the top of that mountain, I was asking Mike, I said, is your daddy gonna wait on us? <laughs> he said, don't worry about daddy. I know where I'm going. <laughs> My point is, it's not how you start, it's where you finish. That man had this, I never seen him run in the woods, but I, I don't know, Ben may have, but he stayed a steady pace hunting, coon hunting, and he'd walk at steady pace. And we up here taking off, busting the gut, getting up. The man will pass you every single time. He'll pass you. So I learned like, golly, bum. So I wanted to be like Franklin where I could get talk about and he wasn't panting, he wasn't being over like we was, trying to breathe. The man stayed the same pace. He could walk top in the mountain, no problem. Well, he got a little older. He didn't coon hunt much. He's talking about Jake. Mike said, I had, well, I had a problem then. I had to stay with Mike then. Franklin wasn't going to be coming up behind me. Well, Jake got about five years old on up where he could hunt. Well, we'd lose the dogs. And uh, Jake said, don't worry about it, Daddy. Don't worry about it. Just leave him, Daddy. Now I realize Mike told me, he said, because Franklin would pick Jake up from kindergarten and they'd go looking for the dogs in Camp Badger and pick them up. So that was a big thing. And I was glad of that because and we didn't spend all night, night long looking for dogs and have to be working the next day. We'd leave them in Franklin and Jake go get the dogs the next day. And, um, but Franklin was well respected. Franklin Gravely uh, knew what he was doing. And you say, why was he in the He stayed in the woods and, and uh, he had his game wardens. He brought them up. And eventually my, uh, Franklin was over the whole state. He was, he made it to the top for his goal was, and more, he, he was the main game one, but he trained them to get in the woods. He wanted his men 
in the woods, make a presence, make us known when you're coming out uh, or when you're going in either way, that you, well, if you was breaking a rule, you had to remember, well, I see Franklin Gravity, is it worth breaking a rule? Because I'm going to, Franklin Gravity will be here. He hears a shot across these mountains. He's going in to where that's at to make sure you follow the rules. That man was a family man. That man was a church going man and he was a good Christian man. I didn't hear him argue with Mike. I didn't hear him argue in the public. He didn't fuss and rip and snort. He was calm. He was to the point. But he never, I've never seen him, as Hound Dog said, in a rage or mad and just out of control. He was always in control. He was always frank and grabby. Wherever you've seen him, he's the same as if you've seen him at work. And that was the same thing, Mike. That's why I have a lot of respect for Mike, and he's my best friend. But Franklin loved these mountains. And you said, what was his passion? His passion, number one, was God. The second was his family. And the third was his job. And his job was to preserve you. It was safety. Safety. He didn't want nothing happening to you in those woods. There's anything, when you've got a firearm with you, anything can happen. Accidents do happen. You got rocks, you got horse mountain, you got rock mountain. My worst one was rock mountain. I hated rock mountain. It was awful. But he was worried about your safety. And if you had a vehicle, Franklin go in there all the time checking. If that vehicle didn't move and it was still there Sunday, he would start tracking and seeing. He was worried about your safety, number one. Second of all, he was concerned about the preserving these mountains and the rules. Frank and Gravely was a good man, and I have a whole lot of high respect for that man. And uh, one other, well, Hound Dog can tell you about the marijuana bus, but one other one that's funny, that uh, my uncle always was a notorious story, is when uh, the old telephones, I don't know if y'all know what about telephone fishing is, but it's very illegal, <laughs> very illegal. And... Uh, I forget that man's name. Mike probably doesn't remember that man's name, but he had a little. The one that was telephoning. Yeah, he had a little sauce. He liked to drink a little sauce, a little bit. Ernest. A little, little, little alcohol, and he was well intoxicated. And he had his buddies out there, and he was had them wires. Now, I've never seen it done. Trust me, but I've always heard my uncle. That radio was it, Mike? Yeah, but he, he, he just that old crank. Telephone. Yeah, I'm talking about no. It had wires on it. Yeah, talking about Ernest, was that telephone? radio? Yeah, Ernest, Ernest radio. Yeah. <laughs> well, they took that old telephone and they turn it, and they stick them in that water, and electrify it, it electrocutes them fish, and they bo they just boil up if it's a lot of fish, and he was he was highly intoxicated, and Franklin done already waiting on them. He knew what they he'd heard about them, and he he was waiting on. He turned that thing. Hello, Franklin. Pick up that phone, Franklin. Hello, Franklin. And them fish boiling up. Next thing he knew, he tapped on the shoulder. Hello, it's Frank Gravely. I can ask you. <laughs> that man like to had messed all over him. His friend, his friend said, so, uh, heard him. Uh, Ernest said, uh oh. <laughs> and his friend says, what's the matter, Ernest? Said he just answered. <laughs> <laughs> so you never know. But the man could slip up on you and he could track you, but he could slip up on you and tap you on the shoulder. He had a natural talent. He loved those woods, but he could walk in those woods. You pick up your feet. My uncle always said, pick up your feet. These dry leaves, but Franklin Gravity could still slip through the woods. But uh, he's a very good man. He was very good, and he was very good to us, and I cherish every moment that I had with him playing ball and in those woods. These mountains, that's why this cemetery it means so much to me because we got to roam all these mountains with my uncle that's buried right over here in Franklin Gravely. And um, thank you, Hound Dog, for letting me have You're a part of this. Welcome. And uh, well, I'm glad you brought that up. about The most winningest team that the Siddle had ever had up to that point. And in fact, uh, his ball players uh, had a little prayer. They called my daddy the toughest angel that ever lived. Okay? But they had a little prayer they would say before each game. Because my daddy had never allowed them to lose two games in a row. And they were uh, all conference champs. You know, every year that he he was coaching down there. 
They say, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for I have been coached by Mad Mac Irwin. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he, he, my daddy could be quite mean when it came to sports. He demanded, he, he demanded the best. And, in, uh, and Franklin was either, Franklin was either a year older or a year younger than my dad. Do you remember what year your dad was born? 27. My dad was born in 26. But Franklin was very, very much like my dad. And you correct me if I'm wrong, okay? He expected the best out of you. He, he, it, nothing medi mediocre was okay. You might get by, but he, he expected you to do your best. And uh, so, uh, like I said, he helped me get my job up here. I was an outsider. Not many people wanted me. Some people despised that I got this job. But Franklin did a background investigation, and it just so happened that I got it, and I'm glad I did. But the, the first time I ever heard about Franklin Gravely was when I was a student at Clemson. I think it was my junior year, because you would have been a senior. And I had a good friend of mine that uh, I played ball with, I grew up with, uh, named Lefty Gregory. And he got to be friends with Mike. They were going to Wofford. And Mike was telling Lefty about his daddy and telling him about this story about a his daddy, you know, uh, wrestling a bear. And they all knew that, hey, if I don't get me a job in forestry when I graduate, I'm going to apply to be a game warden. I've always loved, thought I might want to be a game warden. And so uh, Lefty, had a, Lefty had a brother, Russell, that was my roommate at Clemson. And he says, he said, man, he said, you should have heard Lefty telling us about this game warden that went to the fair and he, uh, he wrestled a black bear and pinned it. I said, nobody does that. You don't pin a black bear. You know, you're making all this up. And, uh, and I had no idea, you know, about my future. And I had no idea that approximately seven years later, I was gonna be working with that same man, okay? That I heard that wild story about. And after working with him, I realized, you know, this isn't just a regular old hillbilly that you might hear about. This man's smart and he's in excellent physical condition and then I began to, re to realize the story is true. And I finally got up the nerve one day to ask your daddy about the story. And uh, he told me about how he pinned that bear. But uh, anyway, he said the worst thing about that bear is that bear smelled bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he'd get up there and that bear breathing on him, you know. But uh, he did pin the bear at the fair. Nobody got hurt. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but Frank, like I said, Franklin had a saying, and he, he'd say this all the time. Anytime the subject came up, and you think about it, Franklin was a little bit ahead of his time. I mean, as a, just a regular citizen out here, what's more important to you? A, a person fishing without a license or a group of outlaws growing marijuana? on public property. What's the more serious offense? And like I said, you can catch a man fishing without a license. It's not a hard thing to do. Catching a man growing marijuana when he's trying to hide and they're hiding, that's difficult, okay? It's, I mean, you've accomplished something when you do that. But uh, Franklin loved to work these mountains so much that if there's anything going on, you know, he wasn't going to sit around and wait. 
to hear some more about it or I'll check on it later. He wanted to go find out what was going on right then and do it right now. And so one Friday morning, and I remember it was a Friday morning because I'd, I had, uh, I, I think I had just gotten out of magistrate's court or I was due to go to magistrate's court and I was going to, I was going to take off early and head to Charleston and uh, take me a couple of days off. So I know it was on a Friday and Franklin called and it was in the, sometime in the, in the spring, but I believe it was, uh, I believe it was just either, it was either just before or just after turkey season. And if you go into Isatoy Valley, anybody anything know about Isatoy Valley here? No? But anyway, there's a beautiful place called Isatoy Valley, just on the other side of 178. And there's a road that used to be called Isatoy Road Extension. I think it's just called Isatoy, Isatoy Road or it may be still be called Isatoy Extension. It goes up there and it dead ends alongside of Isatoy River. And there was a car parked up there, an old car that really didn't belong there. It was out of place. You, you would wonder, why is this car here? And I had seen the car there the day before. And Franklin called and he called for me and he called for Gerald Hawkum and we got up there and Franklin said, this, this car doesn't belong here. He said, uh, you know, it doesn't belong to anybody up this way. And said, uh, I've looked at it. He said, it just doesn't look right. I said, well, Franklin, I said, that car was parked there yesterday. And that car has been moved. I said, because you can see right here where its tire prints were. And I said, it's parked in the same place, but just slightly over. He said, well, I thought somebody might have been lost or hurt. He said, but that leaves two things. They're either growing marijuana or they're poaching. And so without any, we didn't have bottles of water. We didn't, have, we didn't bring nothing to eat, nothing to drink, nothing. He said, well, let's go, let's go see what they're doing. I said, all right. So we start up East of Toy River from the valley. And we just fall on a track every once in a while. And Gerald Hawkins was a pretty good tracker, but Franklin was an expert tracker. And every once in a while, I'd see a whole footprint, even I could see. Okay? And we'd follow those tracks. And then they, the way East of Toy River goes, It'd be real steep on one side and be flat on the other, and then it would change and get steep on that side, flat on the other. And we crossed the river a couple of times. I can't remember which one. I think it was Gerald Hawkum lost his glasses in the river. And we went on up past uh, 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 Little Law Branch, and then we came up to uh, uh, side of Mountain Creek, and when you get to the side of Mountain Creek, you're at the very bottom part of the East Toy Gorge. Has anybody heard of East Toy Gorge on East Toy River? Well, there's a nice hike, there's a nice hiking trail coming down from the top, but when you get the East Toy Gorge, there's no way you can continue up the river. It's straight up on the right hand side and it's kind of steep, but you can go up on the left-hand side. You got to go around it. You cannot follow the river because when they call it a gorge, it's a gorge. It's, the river's maybe that wide. All that water's shooting down through there, okay? Sheer rock. So I'm looking around, and we're all looking around, you know, where the tracks go. And I said, well, look here. Somebody's been fishing. And Franklin says, hold it. I said, don't touch that. He said, said that's, nobody's been fishing here. He says, that's a trip line. He said, look at it. He says, it's going right up through there. He said, look. And sure enough, about knee high, 
it was that monofilament fishing line going up the side of Narrow Ridge, okay? And there's a saddle up there in that Narrow Ridge. And that's, that's where they were camped at. So we just kept following this trip line, staying off of it, taking our time, walking as quietly as we can. I was the last one just following their footsteps. Franklin stops us for us to be quiet. He points, and there's a man up there tending a fire. He's got a pistol on his side. Well, this is not a camping place, and you know it's not a not the time to be hunting with a pistol. Okay. So we ease up there, and this is the one of the first times. Well, right down here in Emory Creek, I saw Franklin sneak up on a fisherman, tap him on the shoulder. But we eased up, and Franklin tapped that fellow on the shoulder and told him to be quiet. And there were several tents around. And back then we had 357 Magnums. We didn't have the semi-automatics. We had revolvers. And uh, so I was the youngest. I was the one that could get down and get back up pretty easy and quick. They said, go into each tent and pull them out. I said, have your pistol drawn, ready. So I went into each tent, and I said, I said, now listen, I'm gonna have my feet sticking out of that tent so you know where I'm at. I said, if any shooting goes on, I said, you better tell where I'm at, because you'll be able to at least see my feet. So I went in there, I tapped them, I had my pistol drawn, laid it right up next to the head, tapped him, reached up underneath the pillow, had a pistol underneath each pillow. Pulled them all out, one by one, and there were seven of them, six young men, and they all had tools to grow marijuana. They had a marijuana field up on the very tip top, there's, there's a little uh, there's a little knoll up there that actually overlooks the gorge, and that's where that little marijuana field. You'd have no reason to go up there, and that's where that marijuana field. They were toting water up there to it, so it was out of the way. And uh, one of the seven, as we setting them down, trying to figure out and gather ourselves, what what are we gonna do with them? How are we gonna get them out of here? You know, and this great big old fat, pot-bellied, he's full of tattoos from head to toe. He's ugly. And he says, you ain't taking me. And Franklin says, what do you mean we ain't taking you? He said, you take me, I go back to prison. I'm on parole. Franklin says, what was you on parole for? He said, for killing a security guard. He said, I killed two. I only got convicted of killing one. He said, but I'm out on parole, so you ain't taking me. We're up there, our walkie-talkies will not get out. The walkie-talkies we had at that time would not communicate outside of where we were at. Even if we could get somebody, who are we gonna call to come get us or to come help us in a hurry? Nobody. There's a handful of people that would know where we're at. And, and then it was gonna take them an hour just to get up there to us. After, they, after we got in contact with, if we could communicate with them. And so I'm thinking, you know, this is a bad scene. I had four years of law enforcement experience. I said, you know, there's, there's seven of them, six young ones. And this old fat, ugly man looks like their leader. You know, they're going to do whatever he says. We got their weapons, and we got to convince them. And so I'm thinking, best thing for me to do is I'm going to put my foot right up underneath his chin, and I'm going to try to, I'm going to actually just try to kick that jaw right off of him. I'm going to knock him out. And Franklin sees me. I'm coming around there like this. He, I don't know. He must have just known what I was getting ready to do. He says, 
he grabs me by the arm and says, hold it. He says, you know what? He said, you're right. We may not be able to take you. He said, but I'll tell you what we're going to do. He said, we're going to try. And we're going to do whatever it takes to take you. Even if we have to call the National Guard. And he said, in the meantime, we'll tie you to a tree up here. Tie you up. Take the rest of them back down. Come back and get you later. And that didn't appeal to him at all. <laughs> so he signed, he, I mean, he knew this man meant business. And I got thinking, we're going to call the National Guard? <laughs> I, mean, I believed him, you know. We're going to call the National Guard? So uh, <laughs> I said, boy. <laughs> but uh, anyway, they all walked out. It was impossible to handcuff them because it was too rough a territory. You cannot expect them. You can't, you can't get out of there without using your hands. It's too steep and too rough. And so Franklin was in the front, Gerald Hawkins was in the middle, and I brought up the rear. And we took them all to Pickens County Jail. And this is to show you the kind of temperament that these boys had. They all got out on bond. And one of them from Greenville, come back to court, done shot his next door neighbor. Didn't kill him, but shot him. So, I mean, they would shoot. The next uh, little story I want to tell you is about uh, Franklin training two of the finest supervisors this department has ever had. I'm not going to mention any names but they both became top supervisors. And I worked under both of them. And they were great men. And, but when they were young, they were working out of Greenville County and Franklin was unit supervisor. He covered Oconee County, Pickens County, Greenville County. And everybody was trained under Franklin. He was the oldest, he knew the most. And so we had these two young men, and they were very ambitious. And at sort of at the end of the day or the middle of the day, whatever they were doing, if they had some free time around lunchtime or whatever, and they're way up there in the woods out in the middle of nowhere anyway, they wanted to just kind of play the old West and see who could outdraw the other with their 357 Magnum. Okay, so in order to do it safely, you got six bullets in a revolver. They'd take the revolver out, empty six bullets. They'd count six bullets. They'd show the other man, I got six bullets in my hand. I'm putting all six bullets in my pocket. I got an empty gun and I'm gonna holster it. And they'd, they'd pace off and they'd turn and they fire to see who, but without a bullet, to see who could draw their pistol the fastest. And Franklin would be able to shake in his head, like, Lord, what am I going to do with these two boys to make them understand, you know, this is not acceptable. This is not safe. You know, you could get hurt this way. So Franklin, in his own way, he didn't report them. They were working for him. He wanted them to be the best. And they were. They grew up, they, they became some of the best men the state ever had. But Franklin decided to just take a little seat over here near a log and watch. And so they were doing their routine, counting out six bullets, showing the other partner they got six bullets, putting them in their pocket, emptying, the emptying uh, their gun. And, holstering an empty gun. Franklin sat over at that log and took out his, his revolver and pointed it behind his back. They, didn't, they, they couldn't see what he was doing. Of course, they were concentrating on each other. So just about the time they stepped off, got ready to draw, 
Franklin thumb cocked that 357 revolver and let off a live round. <laughs> and about the time they drew, that's when he let off that live round. They both grabbed their stomach and just <laughs> thinking that what, you know, which one had been shot. Said, oh my gosh, I've been shot. <laughs> and that's all it took. They never, they never did that anymore. All right. Yeah, that didn't happen again. That convinced them it wasn't worth any gunplay. But both of those men became top supervisors, and I think they, I think they remembered as they, when the time came up to judge an officer on what he was doing, what he did. I think they use a little Franklin Gravely judgment sometimes, okay? And uh, because they were, they were both admired by their other officers in the state. And the last story I want to tell is about one you've already heard part of it about. And it's uh, Ernest Goes Fishing. And like I said, Ernest was a cousin, a distant cousin of Franklin. But Franklin could not stand it if one of his relatives, that was an insult. For, and Franklin had a lot of relatives, and a lot of them were outlaws. When I'm not talking about outlaws, I don't mean they were criminals, but they'd violate the law, okay? And Franklin wasn't gonna stand it. He wasn't gonna have one of his relatives violating the law. That's the one he's gonna catch. So <clears throat> Franklin wanted to catch him red-handed. Okay, he didn't want to just get a hearsay. You, I heard Ernest did this. He wanted to see Ernest do it. And Ernest was doing that telephoning where he puts those lines down in the water, cranks on that old telephone and creates a charge and makes the fish jump. And they'll jump out on the creek, I mean on the creek bank to get away from that electrical charge. And I, like you already heard, Ernest was bad to drink, okay? And Ernest just thought this was just funny as it could be. He out in the middle, and he was in one of the tributaries. This is before Lake Kiwi and before Lake jo Joe Cassie uh, filled up. And so this was just one of the old rivers. And Ernest is there with his buddy. They're all drinking. And he's cranking on that telephone and says, Hello, Franklin. Hello, Franklin, can you hear me, Franklin? Franklin, this is Ernest calling you. About that time, old Franklin steps out from behind some laurel bushes, taps old Ernest on the shoulder, says, I'm right here, Ernest. And Ernest says, uh-oh. And his friend said, what's the matter, Ernest? He said, Franklin just answered me. The thing, the, the thing I want to leave with you, we have lots of stories we can tell, and I'll think of some more if you want me to, okay? But Franklin was not just the best supervisor or the best game warden that I ever worked for or worked with. He was the best teacher, and he was the best role model that a young game warden like me could have ever had. And for that, I'll forever be grateful. And I hate to say that I have some regrets, but when you don't, when you look back and you, you realize I could have done something better, the biggest regret that I have working with this department, since I, those were my first three years, my early years, was not spending every available moment with Franklin. If I had to do it over again, I'd have been at Franklin's back door every morning waiting on him to come out. And it wasn't just work with Franklin, it was a lesson. It was a teaching lesson. Because when we went out to work, we didn't go to work just to catch somebody. That was not the mentality of Franklin that we're gonna go catch somebody. We're gonna, we're gonna get out here and explore. 
And that's the reason Franklin caught so many people that were so difficult to catch. Because he would go that, he would go in the more difficult areas. He might not catch, he might not catch all these little easy cases, but he'd catch the ones that were, didn't think they could get caught. But it was a lesson. And that's what I wish I would have done. I would have wanted to learn every lesson I could with Franklin.